I want to know everything there is to know about you. I am going to introduce me. You must have spotted her by now. She's always there. Don't I deserve love? Somebody has to like me best. Hello, and welcome to the Don't Know Her podcast. I'm Michael. And I am Scott, and we're here yet again, Michael, to talk about um, an icon of film that we wish to kind of natter over. We feel like they're not given the the chance they ought to have. Um, however, in this case, we're talking about someone who's definitely an icon of television. But when we sort of look at their film career, it's a little bit different, perhaps. So worth diving into. Um, but for this very special episode, we have a very special guest uh, introducing Daniel Massey. Hey, Daniel. Hi. Hello. So Daniel is my OG film buddy, I guess we'd say. Pals from Scotland, always going to the cinema and watching endless films together. Um, I suspect that my appetite for films and perhaps my critical mind would be very different if it was not for for you, Daniel. So I'm super happy to have you here today. Uh, But not only that, maybe also perhaps the most qualified guest we could have to talk about uh, actors in this context, Um, given that uh, Daniel has a PhD um, that he worked on, which seeks to understand the roles of the supporting actress in film. Is that not right, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Thank you, Scott. Tell us more. Remind me of the title of your PhD, Daniel. I'll have to remind myself of that. I think it is understanding supporting female film performances using audiovisual film criticism and the Academy Awards, something like that. Well, that is ju- just a little title, just, you know, something small. <laughs> Understanding support, colon, 50 words. Um, so, yeah, we've got a doctor on board, doctor of supporting females in film. How how much better could we get than that? Um, but who specifically, this is someone who I always associate with you, Daniel, but who have you chosen to, to bring to us today? I have chosen the one and only Sarah Michelle Gellar. Sarah Michelle Geller, And uh, for me, this is a daft question, but for everyone listening in, um, what was your kind of get into Sarah Michelle? Where did you land on her? Why do you love her? Why did you bring her? When I was nine years old, watching the episode Gingerbread, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Sky One, 6pm at night. They showed it at 9pm at night without the kind of gory violence cut out. Um, but I saw that when I was nine years old and was hooked and then a week later me and my mum went to WH Smith to try and get VHS and had to you know pretend that they were for my mum because a nine-year-old shouldn't be getting 15 rated VHSs and I was just hooked on Buffy the Vampire Slayer for like all of my childhood Rewatched it again 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 VHS DVDs action figures the weekly magazines or the monthly magazines um yeah but it was the whole cast but Sarah Michelle Gellar on reflection kind of was the anchor of it all but yeah, we'll talk about her. She's an interesting performer. I don't know if my love of acting and love of female performance necessarily <laughs> came from her, but um, my love of many things did. No, we we should also say that it was tied to. So our last episode in this episode is kind of themed around uh, like Halloween, the spooky month of October, and. Uh, Sarah, Michelle, a.k.a. Buffy, and with other films we'll discuss on this felt like a a fitting choice, be it that she is one of the kind of uh, scream queens of the the 90s slashers. So Michael, was was Buffy your entry point to Sarah Michelle Gellar? Um, Buffy, so I would have known Sarah Michelle from Buffy, but would never have watched it. Like, I don't have any memories, really, of watching it apart from a musical episode some gay friend or some gay person showed me at some point. Um, obviously, as a musical theatre nerd. Um, it was Crude Intentions is, like, the time I remember seeing her and her being a very kind of vivid memory for me. Um, and it's a shame, like, as you're saying, like, looking at her filmography... It's so it's like it's, it's much smaller than I thought it was going to be, and it's actually a lot more horror orientated than I remembered. Mm. And as a non kind of horror fan, um, I hadn't seen a lot of these films before. I'd seen Scooby Doo, but that is not um, maybe not the grudge and not 
all, all the uh, screen two or anything um so yeah she's a really fun one and she's someone when i was young like i loved her performance in cruel intentions i loved her character i loved that energy it felt really different from other people and other particularly women um on screen that i'd seen um so yeah i was really excited that daniel you've brought her to the podcast and to look at her career and to think about why maybe it isn't as big as it could have been and why she's, so, she's actually so iconic particularly with the 90s and yet that hasn't translated beyond Buffy in such a big way it's a real shame but yeah shall I give a little rundown of Sarah Michelle's career please mm-hmm. so she was born in April 1977 a month before Star Wars changed cinema forever which I excitedly I'm like yeah I think there's something to that like she came into this new like I don't know like commercial like you know stronger strong female character I don't know there's something about it where I'm like there is something in the in the in the world that's connecting all this um and she was spotted talent spotted at the age of four in New York um and then ended up in um this made for tv film an invasion of privacy in 1983 so she is doing well for herself. She, at a very young age, was banned from McDonald's <laughs> for the rest of her child life because she's in a Burger King advert where she's basically claiming McDonald's have less meat in their food. When I order a regular burger at McDonald's, they make it with 20% less meat than Burger King. So McDonald's took her, like named her, in court and had her banned from their <laughs> restaurants icon like iconic <laughs> behavior for a child um so unsurprisingly her education took a back seat and she was working steadily in, in film and tv she got a lead role in 92 in the tv series swans crossing in 95 she won a daytime emmy for outstanding younger actress in a drama series for the soap opera all my children just doing quite well. And then, of course, 1997 happened. So it's Buffy, as we've already mentioned, huge successful, like, usually iconic. Um, she originally auditioned to play the part of Cordelia Chase. Cordelia, am I saying it right? I'm talking Absolutely. with people 100%. who know. <laughs> but um, she talked to um, the creator, um, Josh Whedon, and uh, to t- be the lead role. And the rest is history, really. She auditioned for it, got it. Uh, Buffy ran for seven seasons, like collected numerous awards. She was nominated for a Golden Globe. Um, never got an Emmy nomination. I'm not sure if that is controversial or not. Was there ever expectation? No. Um, <laughs> poor Sarah Michelle. <laughs> People have won for less, I'm sure. sure. Um, looking at Olivia Coleman. Um, oh, and then... fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Buffy and I've not watched The Crown, so who am I? <laughs> who am I? To... I'm, st- I'm still annoyed MJ Rodriguez didn't win for Pose this okay. year for drama. So oh, right. that's, my, that's my beef. That is my beef. <laughs> anyway, but also 97, she had I Know What You Did Last Summer and Scream 2 in cinemas. So really solidifying quite a particular place in a kind of our age group um, in, in the 90s of these horror kind of fantasy sort of uh, genre films. So her film career kind of did take off. So she has a Cruel Intentions that we mentioned before, Scooby-Doo, where she plays Daphne, um, and its sequel, The Grudge, and its sequel, Southland Tales, which was Richard Kelly's follow-up to Donnie Darko, with a lot of excitement and, and anticipation around that. But uh, again, like things have been quite quiet, though, for Sarah Michelle in recent years. Um, She did have a TV show, um, The Crazy Ones, with Robin Williams in 2013, 14, um, but hasn't really done anything significant since then. Um, Her last film, as being seen, not as a voice um, artist, was Veronica decides to die in 2009. Like that is a chunk of time, which is mad for someone like Sarah Yeah, Michelle. no, that is interesting. She is, for those who are interested in Master of the Universe, um, she does appear, uh, well, she, she doesn't appear, her voice, it can be heard as Tila in Master of the Universe Revelation, which has just been 
recently released. So I'm assuming there's a hunger for her to do more work. Um, she is busy doing lots of charitable things. Um, she's a very lovely person. She's very busy doing that. She also has a cookbook, which I'm really intrigued and hope you have a copy of, Daniel. <laughs> 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 maybe that can be the prize for the quiz later but, that, but yeah so she's busy doing those sorts of things but yeah like it's mad it's mad that someone who was so successful and so iconic and whose name still like resonates with people isn't doing more yeah and i mm-hmm. i mean i uh, th- there is um and maybe this is where your um dissertation will come in um But there is a question I would have about, like, what her persona means. Like, why, you know, a lot of those films, like, we missed or I didn't include um, two romantic comedies that they tried to shoehorn her into what every leading woman was doing at that time. And they are not successful. We will talk about, well, both or or one of them, um, I'm sure. But she kind of defies what women were supposed to be doing and supposed to be cast in as a lead role particularly looking like she does she's this gorgeous who is ageless too she has not (laughs) aged no she looks exactly the same (laughs) but like why i just it really strikes me that you know they they so what parts would she be cast in like when looking at it i was like you know i was thinking of things like action movies or like the Mm. matrix or star wars and i'm like but none of those roles are as juicy or as good or as domineering on the screen as Buffy. Yeah. And I don't know if that is something you guys have thought about or or why you think she has been quiet for so long in terms of film. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's down to her own appetite. I, I mean, obviously anyone who pays attention to kind of the news that circled around Buffy and its creator, Josh Whedon, recently... Um, There are a lot of question marks over what it was like to be on the set at that time. Um, So I'm sure she didn't always have the greatest of times, but she certainly had an incredibly impactful role. Um, Fandom will exist forever around her and around that TV series. And it it kind of really obviously appeals to sort of um, geek culture and all of these things. And and it's something that people buy into. So maybe it's just that nothing nothing could live up to it. I don't know. What do you reckon, Daniel? Do you do you have any more insight into why why she hasn't done a huge amount more? Yeah, I think you're right. I think in my head, there's something to do about her own appetite for it. I feel like it's interesting because I like love acting, love Buffy, love Sarah Michelle Gellar, but I almost view her as like a reluctant actress. Like in my imagining of her, I don't feel like she, I don't, I don't feel like she loves it or is like a thespian or whatever. I feel mm. like it sort of happened to her. And you like alluded to that, Michael, about her childhood. Um, but in terms of Buffy, I feel like it happened. And, you know, Scream too. And I know what you did last summer, Cruel Intentions and so on. I feel like that happened at like a time in her life when you would have just been like on the roller coaster, full pal ahead. And you're just like enjoying the ride. I also think there's the big thing that if Buffy happened now, well, it wouldn't in in some respect but if that type of content existed now it would be received in a way that it wasn't at the time there was this sort of makes me think of like the kind of there's like thinking on like you know the twilight kind of effect and stuff like that anything that was associated as like teeny or it's the same with like you know one direction fans beatles fans and stuff it's always like diminished as just like things that teenage girls or like gay guys like and it's like oh that's not really cool so in terms of like emmy recognition i think in the late 90s early 2000s it just wouldn't have been like possible because there was so much not stigma that's too harsh a word but you know I think there was like a a like resistance to genre and a resistance to kind of female-led things in that way that didn't necessarily take it so seriously and it was very metaphorical about the stories you know it was all through vampires and witches and demons and gods but so many of the stories like there's one in particular at the end of season one where like her mom doesn't know that she's the slayer and she sort of comes out as the slayer and watching that back that's really powerful because it literally is a coming out and there's a big explosive fight and her mom sort of says you know you can't be this way you're choosing to be this way if you're going to be this way you can be but you you get out of the house now and you don't come back and it's like there's things like that all through Buffy that are like in the genre world and they're focused on demons and it's very like extreme but they're you know it like deals with sexual assault and belonging and all these kind of themes that 
at the time were great and she thrived on but I don't think there's like a vehicle for her to do that now and I thought it was just such a unique kind of televisual experience that I don't think that can sort of be replicated in film yeah you're I mean you're totally right like even if not like having seen clips or watching clips of it in preparation for this but also just thinking of her and what I guess I'm connecting with her culturally like it is it is like it's so it makes me so much more excited about her having spent this time because of what she represented and what that you know that mm-hmm. Buffy had created too but yeah she was and even watching her like and we'll talk we'll focus more on individual films but say something like Scooby Doo there is a satisfying thing to watch somebody who you know to be powerful cast as like the stereo- stereotypical like um woman in distress um uh character because you know by the end of it mm. this story is going to al- allow her to be more powerful and use her agency and all this sort of thing in a feminine way not in a way that's like i'm really like masculine and i like she is still very much a woman and very much um like embracing all of that but also being powerful and i still think that's rare today which is a, is a, such a shame. Um, so yeah, I know it really was frustrating thinking of like, why wasn't she cast? And like all the parts I actually was thinking was like gender swapping roles. Mm-hmm. I think you're right because it's something without being like too like analytic and like heavy. I do think there's like something at the core of what made her successful at that time and what sort of is like the barrier to it now is that it's like, if you were to be critical of her like filmography and of Buffet and view it through like the lens of like what it represents and stuff, there's like definitely, if you think of Buffet and Cruel Intentions and Scooby-Doo in particular, it's like about like what female means or it's like how like pop culture constructs femininity. And it's like, she's a really interesting example of like Buffet as a figure rebels against it because she's like the blonde high schooler, but she has heaps of struggles in it. And then you have it flips on its head but like the, what makes Scooby-Doo the casting so successful is because you have the baggage of Buffy similarly with Cruel mm-hmm. Intentions even the, like the act of if you were a Buffy fan at the time the act of seeing her brunette you're like oh my god like you know <laughs> but it's like if you were to like <laughs> it's like the interesting thing of whenever you like study anything from like a feminist lens it's like sometimes it can be seen as really reductive to focus on like hair color and like the beauty of someone but actually that's really like integral to like her star persona if you like I think so oh yeah and I think that like in a way the conversations moved on so much you know in the last like few years that I think the the like conversation that she initiated not her but like that her work did or her casting and what she represented in culture at large I think that's like had its moment and I like it makes me sad but I don't think she can fit into that anymore now because the conversations moved on so much that um, I don't think she can have that impact, but I'm glad that she did at the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, God, I, I, it's hard to think of someone quite like her or what she represents. Like, if I see her and what I think of, um, even like every watching Cruel Intention, she has, this is, it's, you know, um, it's a third into the movie. She talks about like, I am, she basically says, I'm no more evil than you to um, Ryan Philippe, who is our hero, really our protagonist of the story. But because I'm a woman, I have all these different obstacles. Like, I have all these things. So she's literally, the character is saying, I'm fucked over. And the irony is, I don't know if, like, even though the character is written, it's like, ah, but still as an audience, we still want her to be, to be, be punished by the end of the story does that make so she's kind of yeah. even though the character is standing apart and saying like all of this is true when you reflect on it still she's a part of a story that's like let's tear her down mm-hmm. it, <laughs> so it, it is um yeah she's great i i'm just so i'm just so excited and i'm so excited to talk about some of these films yeah no 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 for sure but let's let's just hold fire and i just want a little bit more on on kind of chatting around Buffy. I know that we're going to focus on the films and that's what we do, that's what we always do, but we would be remiss to not dive into a little bit. So, I mean, Daniel, you are the the more seasoned expert on Buffy. Out of interest, how how many times have you watched like Buffy? How much times have you watched each series, each episode? I like, would say I've probably time? seen the series in full, like, I don't know, six, seven times probably. Yeah. Um, and then other episodes, probably about 20 episodes 
I've seen maybe like 10 or 15 times, just, yeah. you know, just certain ones rewatching. But that was like an obsessive childhood. Like I would, I remember when I got season five and I was obsessed with it in a month or two, the VHS became like so granulated and like I'd watched it, so what I'd watched a certain tape too many times that it became unwatchable so yeah a bit of that wore <laughs> actually wore it out that's very impressive it is just such a an easy get in like you can dip into it i i don't know a lot of the backstory of buffy um but you can put one on and it is a really enjoyable ride but there are episodes which i think are like so great there was uh, an episode called hush which is a silent episode it's amazing the musical episode i love um and then some of the later ones where it all sort of goes tits up dramatic melodrama to the max um is wildly fun too but if you were to point people to like either maybe both what's the best buffy episode in your opinion daniel and also where do you think she's at her best in Buffy? Where is Sarah Michelle at her best? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think the ones you kind of name checked would probably be favourites. Um, mm. um, also, the gift of like the final episode in season five is just like a bit of a weepy one. I just like watching that. Um, I think she's possibly at her best kind of throughout it I don't know I think because Buffy is so genre focused and it's so like fantastical in its plot I think the thing I think about Sarah Michelle is that she's like just really competent like I think she gets in my imagining of her I think she gets that she doesn't have to do that much performance wise because there's so much like genre and demons and effects and magic stuff going around that it's like she doesn't really need to like act it up but when she gets to play someone else other than Buffy like a robot or there's a few episodes in particular where you know there's a Halloween episode from season two where the characters become their Halloween costumes and she sort of becomes an like 18th century like princess kind of character who's like oh no please save me and getting to but again that's successful because you're aware of it like the sharp contrast to what she is in Buffy um yeah it's interesting you say competent because I think that that's a word we use quite a lot when we're talking about people on this podcast, and she is as a kind of star leading a show for seven seasons. That's yeah. right, isn't it? Seven seasons. I mean, she she can play those more melodramatic or heightened moments very well. Like it's it's not suddenly like oh she's having to give more now and then it loses anything. No, no, no. She's really very strong at doing that as well and being believable in this soapier styling but it, not even that i think it is relatable and she 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 harnessed that by being relatable throughout she's she's just a great star but that i would say that sort of melodrama pours over to her film career or i would say her strongest mm-hmm. sure moments in film um I love it like when I read that she was in a soap opera and that's like a daytime Emmy she would like it all made sense so like yes and this is what draw draws me to her as well yeah. if it's, it's campy in a certain way um I don't know like I don't know Daniel if there's a film you think she's best in and maybe that's the best way to go into her film yeah career. No, I, I do. First, I'll just like pick you up. I totally agree with you about the soap opera aspect of it because it reminds me of, I'm sure I saw an interview with her where she kind of discussed this and it also reminds me of Julianne Moore when she was in, I think, As the World Turns. I'm not sure. Right, yeah. And she speaks about that as like being like, it. and it strikes me as Buffet is similar because I think the writing in Buffet is great, but when you're churning out 21, 22 episodes and there's seven seasons of it, it's like, you know the scripts come and go and it's not like oh let's delve into the character and it, it's like no i need to say these lines cut so we can move on because we're doing you know 16 hour days and i think there's an element of that that there's like when it comes to the competency it's like well we just need to do this i'm holding this show up i'm like you know i am the ca- title character so we just we just do it and get it done so i don't think she ever gave i imagine she didn't give herself like opportunity to really relish moments and be like let's do another take in a different style it's like no I've got too much to do in terms of her I feel like her most successful performance or the one that I yeah her most successful performance I think is Cruel Intentions because yeah. for, mm-hmm. for many reasons which yeah you'll all probably want to talk about and I have my own theories about kind of what makes it so successful but yeah that would be my my shout yeah let's do it Cruel Intentions what a film yeah, well, well, Cruel Intentions, for those who are 
uninitiated, <laughs> um, is an adaptation of Dangerous Liaisons, uh, which was uh, a play by Christopher Hampton and then a film. Um, and it's a story in this version of um, step-siblings yeah. who basically toy with the people around them and they like for not m- any reason other than they're bored and they're rich. Yes. So it's uh, Sarah Michelle Geller and Ryan Philippe. So Ryan Philippe is um, the protagonist, essentially, and they bargain with each other. If I win, then that hot little car of yours is mine. And if I win? I'll give you something you've been obsessing about ever since our parents got married. Be more specific. In English, I'll fuck your brains out. If, if he succeeds in winning over Reese Witherspoon's character, who is this very virtuous, like, I'm never going to have sex till I'm married character, um, and he also has to help... <laughs> Sarah Michelle with um what would you say like dirtying the name of Selma Blair <laughs> like it, it's basically a lot of sordid storylines going on it is like my memory of it so I saw it when I was quite a young teenager mm. like is that it's this horny movie yeah watching it now I'm a little bit horrified in that it's like they are step siblings and the way they're interacting with each it's just really uncomfortable to watch the older like I'm much older now I've probably not seen it for 15 years so I find it a lot more uh uncomfortable to watch um also there's a there's a there's a, there's so many different things consent is different it has a different meaning in this movie to what and and in the 90s when it was made compared to now but it's also just a wild ride and Sarah Michelle is it's just having such a great time in a part, I should say, which Glenn Close played in the uh, D- Digital Liaisons films and got an Oscar nomination for. I mean, we're not going to claim that Sarah Michelle should have been Oscar nominated, but she mm-hmm. is having such a whale of a time. Yeah, this is like so much fun for her. Um, it's it's interesting you say that about how you feel watching it now. I guess it's still, it relates to Dangerous Liaisons and, and it has that, I mean, Dangerous Liaisons is the same format. It's very sexually charged. There is still this strange relationship between these two step siblings. I, I think it is the kind of the same dynamic there between John Malkovich and Glenn Close's characters there. Um, but there's maybe something, I still really enjoy Cruel Intentions and I think it's it's such a fun watch for many reasons. The soundtrack um, all of the performances. There's moments in it which are now super iconic, um, but it, it maybe maybe in moving it towards the kind of teen movie genre, it, it, away from this sort of period piece, which is what Dangerous Liaisons is. It, some of the moments become ickier, um, perhaps. But oh god, it is still just such a ride. I think you're right that like you could argue that like we like the film does set up a desire for Sarah Michelle's character to be like punished. But at the same time, I remember being really upset with like the ending when I was watching it and I didn't want that to happen to her. Like, cause I really, I didn't like like the character. I knew she wasn't a nice person, but you know, I, it doesn't, I don't think it totally like villainizes her, but. No, it doesn't. It, cause it has that moment at the end where she has her own sort of moment of sadness again and in, in realizing how it's all, you know, played out and she she's completely fucked it. Um, and in that moment, you are like, yeah, but also that uh, there is something. There's She is playing it really well. Like, yeah. this is perfect casting for her. So this is sort of mid-Buffy, right? So this is 1999 Cruel Intentions, yeah. um, which puts it kind of roughly in the middle, early to middle of, yeah. of her Buffy career. Um, and it lets her do something so wildly different from Buffy, something that we then see sort of more elsewhere in in kind of film stuff she does. But here, it's just perfect as that kind of conniving, uppity, mannered mm-hmm. person, very kind of posturing with Ryan Felipe. They're playing these games. Um, and there's the really iconic kiss scene between her and, and Selma Blair mm-hmm. um, in Central Park. And it, it's just the way she does it. It's so like 
matter of fact. And I, I understand that it's kind of the star wattage mid Buffy, like why would you not cast her? But there is also kind of kudos to be given to casting her because it just worked so well. I don't don't know who else would have could have been cast. Do you know like she is so perfect and I guess I, I just think she's so powerful. And that there is, a, there is, and I guess this is from Dangerous Liaison, there's so much time given to her character to be fleshed out. We hear her say, It's all right for guys like you in court to fuck everyone, but when I do it, I get dumped for innocent little twits like Cecile. God forbid I exude confidence and enjoy sex. Do you think I relish the fact that I have to act like Mary Sunshine 24 seven so I can be considered a lady? I'm the Marsha fucking Brady of the Upper East Side, and sometimes I want to kill myself. She's also having, you know, hot sex secretly and doing all that. You know, she's having, she's living her life. So she's, she's performing to most people, and then she's doing all this other stuff. I totally agree, and I think, yeah, I completely agree. And I even more so agree with you, Scott, about the, like, the delivery of it. I'm thinking of, like, when she's, like, tugging Selma Blair's hair when she's, like, away to kiss her and stuff. And, and I think as well when it's, like, the, um when she's like there with like her maid or help or whatever, May Lee, and then that's her name. And she like knocks or like Sarah Michelle's character knocks over the box. And she's like, May Lee, who's yeah. talking about this? And it's like, but like, it's, it's like a, a it's like a, a legitimate thing that it like makes performances so like fun to watch when you're aware. I'm not going to get like too intense from the PhD, but it's something I spoke about a lot in that of like what makes some supporting performances so like relishable is this thing called like expressive incoherence when you're aware of a performer performing to the performers. It's almost like dramatic irony. So it's like, you know that she's not a virtuous character, but it makes it really fun to watch her pretend to be to Christine Baranski. Yeah. And you yeah. know she's not, so then it makes it really fun to watch her go, May Lee, be careful, I've told you of this. And then tug her hair and have Selma Blair and all these other characters fall for it. It makes it even more like pleasurable for the audience to watch it. I Like I think, but I mean, I know because people have like said that about performances for like decades, but it makes it like, and when a performer is cast perfectly, Perfectly to be able to tap into that so it's like both sides of the coin at the same time it's like oh it just makes it so like juicy she's and it really frustrates me because i was thinking in the 40s say in the 30s there were these great female parts where you were like let's think like scarlett o'hara literally has a lot of this sort of like i'm a spoiled bitch and i could do whatever i'm not suggesting we ever remake gone with the wind um, but that sort of part Sarah Michelle could have done like I don't know I was just like well you're just it's the wrong time mm. yeah I don't know I was just so taken and I, to be honest I was I was taken by a lot of her performances like a lot of these movies like Scooby-Doo like how I I, I guess when I I've seen it as a as when I was younger I went to see it in the cinema I remember going having such a great time but not thinking much of it Rewatching it for this it's such a hoot like it's such a just enjoyable how they like make it cartoony like how and as you said earlier like how well cast it is um and scooby-doo for those who do not know is about <laughs> the, <laughs> about we all surely everyone knows but it is about, go on. tell us what it's about go on well it's about the oh my god what you got mystery mystery ink no mystery incorporated that's it right yeah it is mystery ink isn't it that's yeah what mystery ink but even now, I'm questioning it. No, it is mystery. <laughs> no. It is mystery. Ink. But, but they yeah. they turn up and they try and solve um, some kind of supernatural mystery, but it never is supernatural. It's a human being who is behind the mask. Um, and yeah, so Sarah Michelle Geller plays Daphne, but there's also Linda Cardellini who plays Zel Zelma. 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 <laughs> You're getting Sabrina. <laughs> Velma. <laughs> um, and Freddie Prince Jr. who plays Fred and Matthew Lillard. 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 Shaggy. 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 But that's perfect. And I mean, that is the best casting. Holy yeah. shit. To have, he, He's so good. He literally got it down. Like, that is insane that he managed to do that so impeccably. And the, and a real huge downside is the CGI. So Scooby Doo is an actual CGI dog, um, but the CGI wasn't developed well. Like, it's not cats bad. 
the musical <laughs> cat's bad, but it is not great. It's not great, Scooby Doo. No, I mean, 2002 is when it came out. Gosh, yeah, I remember going to the cinema to see it and being so excited to see it and coming out of it being so delighted to have seen it. I thought it was like the best thing ever. Um, Watching it back now um, as a 29-year-old, I think less so. Um, But everything you're saying is true. It is fun. It's cast so well. They are all cast really well and impressively so because I think if they were to try and do something like that now, it just wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to land it. Also because kind of, this was done just coming out of the 90s, kind of Scooby-Doo still sort of at its peak, um, and also the sensibilities of these performers on screen in their own right, sort of being able to work with that. If we were to do it now, it just, it would be too much of a muddle, and it would be kind of um, progressed in a way to make it this new version, and and it it wouldn't be what they've done here, which is to literally capture um, these characters as they were in the cartoon as uh, live action characters and it's it's fun it, it there it, there is a lot that is fun about it there's a lot that's not so fun about it watching it now um nearly 20 years later but hey it was good and she's fun at it again like she she does a grand job here as Daphne she totally does and I think again it's like it's almost like inside jokes. I think of her career as a lot of being like inside jokes and it's all very like meta and in reference to one another. Like it's totally successful by itself. You could have never seen Buffy or Cruel Intentions or know of her like kind of appearances and Scream 2 and the likes. But knowing all of that and kind of what she represented at the time, it makes it really fun as well. Like, like Cruel Intentions is sort of the extreme opposite of Buffy on one hand, but then Daphne is also the extreme opposite in another way. So it's kind of like she's you know, Buffy's this kind of like middle ground of, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep going back to genre, but I do think there's like something really like important about that, that that's, I think, when she's most successful. And I, I know everything has a genre, but when I say that, I mean like horror or sci-fi or even like kids yeah. stuff, kind of like Scooby-Doo. I think that's when it's like, they can bounce off of each other really well. Something like Buffy, something like Scooby-Doo, yeah. something kind of like Cruel Intentions. And then of course, horror, they're kind of like the classic. And I think they allow you to do something different and also in terms of the characters we can probably get into it but like the more like the opposite of you know where you alluded to it michael but good characters being rewarded and bad characters being punished that is like so classic in the horror genre Mm -hmm. of what happens to bad sexual well as the film perceives it bad sexual characters and the good ones um die and that's kind of a real if you compare cc and scream 2 to uh, Daphne yeah. that's like a really interesting counterpoint that um Cece could very well be Daphne you know grown up if Daphne, if Daphne was born 20 years 30 years later she would be Cece possibly would yeah. you say like Scoob the, the one thing I'd say about Scooby-Doo or her performance in it compared to the others is she's funny yeah which I guess is a genre thing but there's there's this one scene in particular which I was so taken with even though there's a a racist element of voodoo doctor and casting a black man in this role, but she arrives and she's like, Aha! You want me to go up to that castle? Didn't you just say what I said? But you're scary. And you knew I'd do the opposite of what you said. So you told me not to go to the castle, so I would go up to that castle where you set a trap to capture me. Unless, unless you knew I'd figure it out. So you told me not to go up to the castle, so I would think that you wanted me to go so I wouldn't go just like you didn't want me to. Huh? I'll find out what you're hiding in that castle. You watch. What in the world? But it's not something you see very often in her other work. And I was like, oh, it's a shame she didn't mm-hmm. get to do a silly, like, broad comedy. Because mm-hmm. um, I really enjoyed that um, her, that aspect of her part in Scooby and Scooby Doo too. This is how much I love Scooby Doo. I watched Scooby Doo. <laughs> like I just thought they were so much fun and I wasn't expecting them to be enjoyable. Good. Um so so yeah, but what you're alluding to I guess with let's say like I don't know what film you which one you want to talk about. Well, let's next, go but... into Scream 2 if we're yeah. talking about how it kind of maybe lines up if if, if that's going to be her in kind of that parallel world, maybe that's what they kind of would would be. Uh, so I guess maybe a bit of context again for those who haven't seen sc- the Scream films. So this is the second one. Scream films is about um, a woman whose mum gets murdered and then 
like a year later, I think there's like this new killing spree and this new killer's on the go and he starts terrorizing her and he's doing it and terrorizing all of her friends based on scary movies. It was kind of the original, so it's Wes Craven who directed it, who is kind of one of the horror masters, directed Nightmare on Elm Street amongst others. Um, And he was kind of the first to do this kind of taking horror and deconstructing it and and using those elements to kind of make it both exciting in a new way and funny at the same time. Um, And then Scream 2 was the sequel. So Scream 1 came out in 96, Scream 2 comes out in 97, so just a year apart. And they are incredibly linked together, both in ways which could be perceived as perhaps lazy, but then in the context of the Scream franchise, it works really well. So it's then a film has been made about the events of the first film, and it creates this resurgence and and a kind of killer returning to sort of do these things again. And the iconic scene from the first screen scream at the beginning with Drew Barrymore on the telephone uh, being terrorized by um, Ghostface, um, kind of in a home invasion way. She's making her popcorn, um, and he's outside the house trying to get in, and then uh, after her, it, it's because it's iconic. I'm sure everyone knows that scene. Sarah Michelle Gellar is basically playing the the Scream 2 version of that character, being in the house, on the phone, picking up the phone, hey, I'm outside your house, doing that thing all over again. Yeah, I mean, God, she has, like we see her in school earlier on, bitching about, um, <laughs> like, sequels not being good, and all these sort of, like, on-the-nose sorts of things which Scream does. And then we see her later, as you say, in the house, yeah. And she gets a phone call. She's alone in this... this um, uh, what you call it house uh, fraternity house, is that what you... yeah and um she's being terrorized <laughs> via the phone <laughs> she thinks it's her boyfriend it's all sorts it's all sorts of fun she's she like we were talking about this earlier before recording but it is a bit hard to believe she couldn't beat this person up because of what we know of her um and she also is is a quite a physical sequence and it goes on for quite a bit and she does quite well for quite a long time um but for whatever reason she decides to to stay in the house and run up the stairs and not not like ask for help when literally someone else is in the house but she's really fun like i yeah it's a star kind of performance and I think the film knows that because, well, like Wes Craven spoke about it, that he definitely knew that with Drew Barrymore in the first one, for example, that the effect that would have um, having the sequence go the way it does with her in particular. And I don't know exactly where it would have timed with the filming of Buffy, but it, again, it feels like a, a knowing piece of casting to think, oh, well, who's kind of the Drew Barrymore type of this film? Not exactly, but who's the kind of blonde that's going to get chased around the house and will die? Oh, what if we cast Sarah Michelle Gellar? She might have not, you know, I don't know if season one had come out or it's like, oh, she's actually just filmed, they just finished, you know, production on season one of this where she is like, you know, this kind of like kick-ass high school cheerleader who like saves the world and kills vampires and does all this. Oh, that could actually be quite fun. I feel like you're right. The Scream franchise has a sense of humour about that. Even thinking, oh, well, when that comes out, it's going to be really interesting to have her be across all the kind of tabloids and media as Buffy, the vampire slayer. And then, oh, she's in a new film, she's in Scream. And it's like, what? She's like throwing bikes down the stairs and then she's like hurled out the window. And it's like, it's particularly interesting to see the fate that she comes to with the context of Buffy and knowing how, and similar with I Know What You Did Last Summer as well, being like, oh, no, you, as a like, oh, from what we're aware of you in like the cultural realm, you are so much better than this. You could destroy that person. But in the context of those two films, no. I was really shocked because I'd never seen I Know What You Did Last Summer and I just assumed her part would be stronger. Like I, I, when she turns up and she is the, you know, the, the she's wearing the tiara, she's like the belle of the ball, she's, she's like playing kind of the stereotypical, you know, young female part in a horror film. There's also like, so I know what you did last summer, it's a group of four uh, people who are, are graduating from high school and they accidentally hit someone and they have to get rid of the body and then they're terrorized the next year because he he knows what you, they did and he's back. But she, but she's also quite fun. Like she's the one that kicks the body into the water. <laughs> I don't think I can, Barry. Shit! We agreed! God, come on, Barry! It's not too late! You! Shut up! 
Just shut up! Christ already, I'll do it! I love it again, campy, like fun, yeah. silly. But thankfully, when the film does push forward a year, she's given, you know, a bit of an not a, an original arc, but for her, something I've not seen. Um, where she's, you know, Jennifer Love Hewitt, um, who is looking the year later, she wants to reconnect with the three other people in the car. And um, she's looking for Sarah Michelle Geller. She's like, Do you have her number in New York? <laughs> <laughs> in the shop store that her, uh, Sarah Michelle's sister works in, she's like, New York, she's over there. And you see this person who had all these dreams, and within a year, and because of trauma, as well as lots of other reasons, life, she's not, she's never going to New York. Her life probably won't ever leave this town. What happened to New York? I went for a while, it, um, it didn't really work out. Of course, Scary Movie just made me laugh at too much of of it <laughs> yeah yeah i'd forgotten how specifically even though scary movie is grounded in scream it is this this the 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 arc of the first one is pretty much like i know what you did last summer that is that's where it came from but it is fascinating to go back to what you were saying before daniel about kind of where it tied in i am fascinated because these two films are 1997, which is the same year that Buffy starts. So that like you're saying, it's wondering whether they were filming, that. Like, how did they have the foresight? Because specifically with Scream 2, it's like, you need sort of that kind of star energy for that moment. Mm -hmm. And in this, it's the same. And it's, I'm, I'm fascinated. I would have thought they would have come later and it would have come off the back of Buffy or like the other way around, there would have been a clearer distinction on where these things fall in her career. But these three fil the, the, these two films in Buffy, started in you know they were 97 um but it is she is an amazing scream queen and it's not something that's necessarily easy to nail like i know we've seen a lot of crap actors do it um and it still can be fine but she's exceptional at it she's very very good because she she kind of seems powerful and above it but also subscribes to the kind of conventions that we do want from our scream queen certainly of this era late 90s slasher movies but it it links in very nicely with buffy as well and um, because for good or for god for good or for bad slasher films are female centric the the 99 of the time they are female centered stories sometimes those females can be shite but a lot of the times they have been amazing characters that we get from these things and not to say that either of the parts she's playing are but she brings so much to them and i can understand it as kind of a singular appetite that she had for kind of elevated female roles within genre work. It, it just all seems to fit together quite well. And her name is Karen Shivers. It's so great. Yeah, and I think also it's worth flagging that Kevin Williamson, the screenwriter of the Scream, certainly the first two Scream films anyway, was also the screenwriter on I Know What You Did Last Summer. So maybe there's a kind of link in there yeah. in terms of her working between those um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm just sort of fascinated about her placement at this time. She also just to like go back because I think the the lead part like Neve Campbell or Nev Campbell and Jennifer Love Hewitt, who are essentially the leads in Scream, and I know what you did last summer, are hysterical women for a lot of it. Sarah Michelle Geller is a very different sort of presence. And sadly, not a, not the sort of presence we get too often as a lead in a horror film. So it is a bit of a shame. I, I would have loved to have seen her be the lead with that personality in a slasher yeah. film. I, um, I would totally love it. I would totally love that too. But you're right. It's like, that's what I was kind of meaning with like the, the like final girl trope or whatever is it's just for the time. And there's like horror films that kind of play with it now, I suppose. But like, yeah, it's just a shame that that would have been impossible because it, and that's the thing that kind of makes watching all the kind of slasher horror films fun. If you're particularly invested in that genre is, you know, from the beginning of the film who will live and who will die, it's immediately going to be the kind of virtuous person. It'd be really interesting if they like flipped it on its head but yeah, you don't get those characters. Similar, you could argue with um, Cruel Intentions. It's not a horror film, obviously, but it has a similar like moral arc, if you like, where it's definitely the exception to the rule where those characters are 
not rewarded, but you know, they, they come out on top. It's like it's going to be the maybe like the boring brunette. But I mean, I love, you know, Sydney Prescott. Like if I have a daughter, I want to name her Sydney after Sydney Prescott. Oh like <laughs> I love her. She's like an iconic screen queen in yeah. one way. But she's a very like morally beige kind of character which is not a problem but they don't get rewarded in the like narrative arc of slashers or horrors because it's all about men like you know dictating what's good and bad behavior really. yeah that's yeah bizarre. yeah and she, and that's what i like about sarah michelle in scream 2 in particular in that conversation about film or whatever she's the one like saying this is she's starting it she's saying no you're wrong you love james cameron you love like no no these things are incorrect um it's almost like she gets punished for it in the next exactly movie. and that's that is the sort of thing i guess going back to like cruel intentions again it's like it's a shame to see such a strong female well presence being sidelined or quieted or silenced basically um but that is you know that is and Scooby Doo also it, weirdly this trajectory is like it starts off they're all annoyed because Fred is becoming the star and by the end they're like well that's okay that Fred is a bit more famous than the rest of us do you know which is like what <laughs> like what is this trajectory like yeah. why can't Sarah Michelle play a part come in just be the presence and just always have it do you know what I mean Totally. And I don't think that's true of any of the movies we've not even talked about. I mean, we won't have time now, but Suburban Girl, this rom-com with Alec Baldwin, her, she literally has only a, has a voice because Alec Baldwin is there to help her in this very by numbers rom-com, which is so uncomfortable to watch Alec Baldwin trying to romance. Um, uh, yeah, that's yuck. He calls her pumpkin in like the first moment he meets her and he's like, you want dinner pumpkin? It's like, ugh, leave her it's alone. So it's despicable. <laughs> it's so horrible to watch. <laughs> but um, I'm glad I saw it in some ways. I was in, in well, that's a screen, a screen queen and horror sort of film in a different way. <laughs> but yeah, even like Southland Tales, which I guess is the one movie we have to talk about before we go to the quiz and all. I don't know even know how to describe the story, but it's set... No. In a future, like a most, a lot of the first like fifteen minutes is just exposition. Like this is how complicated the story is. So I guess the only way I can describe it is that there's this kind of celebrity boxer that's also an actor played by Dwayne Johnson, who wants to work with this porn actress who wants to expand her brand, played by Sarah Michelle Gellar, and they also work with a police officer played by Sean William Scott. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah. And they together work to to improve their situation in the world. And there's also Justin Timberlake, as this kind of office army soldier who's kind of off the wall. I like I just recommend people to watch it. Um I, it's just a mad it's a mad film and I'm not sure what my opinion like I enjoyed it and I got a lot out of it but I put it in a category of films that are so ambitious and over the top so that I don't, my heart enjoys it, but as a film, it's probably not great. And I should say the more I listen to Richard Kelly talk about it, the less I liked it <laughs> because he seems to think he's made a masterpiece and um, which I certainly don't think this is, but it's, there's just so much to it. And she is so much fun as this yeah. porn star, ambitious woman. She has some stupid pieces of dialogue scientists are saying the future is going to be far more futuristic than they originally predicted <laughs> but in general she's just such a hoot they're all such a hoot to watch yeah it's it, yeah i really don't know what to make of it i can't come out of it with a sort of clear opinion on what i think uh, i don't think i enjoyed it too much because it, it just was too much and and I lost track of it. And then it's incredibly long as well. So I was sort of just a bit like, this is playing out. I'm fully lost in what's going on, but I'm enjoying the ambition and I'm enjoying kind of the the, the broadness of what is going on and what these, these actors are getting to do, especially Sir Michelle Gellar and some of the more supporting performers. It's in incredibly out there um but she does have some fun dialogue there's her we are a bisexual nation speech which i enjoyed um but yeah she does it very well i think she's kind of dressed for this part 
it's she's kind of dressed and, and plays it in maybe too stereotypical a fashion. It's written in a bit too kind of she wears furry pink jackets and I don't know, there's an air to it which just is too obvious considering the film is not at all very obvious, but uh, I thought that was maybe a more dull choice in a film which certainly is not full of dull choices. It is quite something and also something that there's that he wants to make a sequel for even now. I think he said it this year, in 2021 as we speak, that this film which came out in 2006, now he's talking about reteaming the actors if they will even do it to, to make a sequel. <laughs> I don't know. I gave that film four on Letterboxd. So, <laughs> so it must be great. <laughs> no, and so did I. So did I. Well, but then <laughs> the more I think about it, and the, like me like writing, looking at my notes for this, I was like, what? What happened? <laughs> like, I didn't yeah. even... Some of it, I, I forgot... Like Wallace Shawn's bit, like Miranda Richardson, they're playing these wild parts. There's musical sequences. It's, it's just. I think you're right. I, it also, and I mean, on one hand, this is like a ridiculous comparison, but it is something I thought the first time I I watched it, which was like a a year ago maybe. Um, it reminded me the reason that I felt like I responded to it was a similar way that I felt I responded to Kenneth Lonergan's Margaret, both the like cinema release as well as his like longer one, in terms of I just really got into like it being like too big and it had these really like brash ideas and it took itself really seriously and it was like trying to yeah. make so many points at the same time and it would become really messy and it was like there was just all these like holes appearing in the box and the film was just falling out of it and they were like trying yeah. to they're trying to like put it back in by putting all these different kinds of like thematic tape over it and it was like but that contradicts what you did before but it's like I don't know I just really sometimes like that when a film is taking loads of chances but not many of them pay up off in the conventional sense of what you want film to do i don't know i i really was just blown away by the ambition of it and thought she she was sarah michelle's decent in it um it's not it's not an actor's film is the best way to put it um (laughs) but no i mean all of the all of these films even suburban girl i just had a hoot like the whole thing (laughs) i just love spending time with her (laughs) Oh, good. Well, there's something to take from it because I mean, some of these are are perhaps lesser entries, um, but oh, I'll, I'll never watch any time. of these again. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. We've I mean, never done that, except *Cruel Intentions*, which we always will come back to for Ryan. Oh, when I have children, I'm um, certainly going to sit them down. This is what school is like. This is what people are like. <laughs> Be wary. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, I think that's probably our main touching points in the film career of Sarah Michelle Geller, which means that you guys now have the tremendous treat of going head to head in the quiz. And no pressure, Daniel, but our last guest won. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All righty, let's quiz it. Okie doke. So I've got a couple of rounds um, for Sarah Michelle. Um, so you guys are going head to head. Um, and the first round's a bit of a warm up because the second round's really vital, very important. Um, but first up, inspired by Buffy. Um, I actually know the prize. We need to talk about the prize. So as mentioned earlier, you're going to both receive, not both, if you win, you will receive a copy of Sarah Michelle Gellar's cookbook. Um, if you both win or draw, neither of you do. And I'll get one for myself. Um, but the first round based on Buffy, or inspired by Buffy, I should say, um, is a game I like to call Who's the Vampire Slayer? So oh God. I'm going to name a film, and you're going to take it in turns, um, and you'll get a film each. And I just want you to tell me the actor in that film who played the Vampire Slayer hunter however you want to look at it so we'll start with you daniel so first up uh, we're going to start a fairly straightforward we have 1998's blade Ah. um and i'll say if we don't get it we'll hand it over to the other party no um no, it's gone. It's gone. Oh, Pass it over. no. Oh, gosh. All right, Michael. Blade. Who is the vampire slayer in Blade? <laughs> that would be 
Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, no. Michael yeah. has taken uh, a head at the beginning on a question that wasn't his. And now he gets a really easy one, too. Michael, who is the titular vampire slayer in 2004's Van Helsing? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. Oh, you, you just want me it. to say you because I can't, I can't <laughs> say the name. Me? Jackman? <laughs> me? No, you. <laughs> Hugh Jackman. Ding, ding. Michael's up 2-0. Okie okay, doke. So back to Daniel. Number three from 1992, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Also playing Van Helsing. Um... Oh, I'm trying to think who's in the cast. Um, that it would be. Count me down. There is actually the actual vampire slayer in Brad That's what I'm Dracula with. is not this character actually. So there's two ways you could answer this, and I would accept both. I should confess that I've also not seen either of these films that you're asking me about. Um, I honestly don't know. Well, Michael, do you? You're it's going back to you then, Michael. Do you know who the vampire slayer is? Keanu Reeves. No. Yes. Um, not Keanu Reeves. Winona Ryder, who would have been an acceptable answer. She's the one who actually slays oh, the I vampire. See. But Van Helsing is played by Anthony Hopkins. So, oh well, no points gained. Uh, Michael. 1992's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, because we must point out at this point that Buffy did not start with the TV series. I mean, I stab in the dark. I couldn't have, I wouldn't have a clue who played her. I'm going to say Sarah Hunter. That is incorrect, not Sarah Hunter. Daniel, do you know who played the original Buffy? Christy Swanson. Christy Swanson. There we go. Brilliant. Okie doke. So we did uh, turn that one around in the end there, but we're moving into a really important round now. So uh, when Daniel came to us with the idea of talking about Sarah Michelle Gellar, um, Michael and I have both made the faux pas countless times of instead seeing the other triple barreled Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker. So in this really significant game we're going to play Sarah Michelle Geller or Sarah Jessica Parker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a character name. I need you to tell me which of the Sarahs it is, uh, which for what you'll get one point, and then if you can also name the film, you'll get a second point. Okie doke. So this is then back to Daniel for the first one. We have Carrie Bradshaw. That would be Sarah Jessica Parker in Sex and the City. Sarah Jessica Parker, Sex and the City, Carrie Bradshaw. Fabulous. That is two points for you, Daniel. Um, keeping it light and easy for entry points to this round, Michael, yours is Buffy Summers. <laughs> in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, that would be Sarah Michelle Geller. Sarah Michelle Geller. Well done. That's two points for you as well. Daniel, this one is Catherine Myrtle. <laughs> that would be um, Sarah Michelle Geller in Cruel Intentions. Sarah Michelle Geller in Cruel Intentions. Fabulous. Two points for you. Michael, Meredith Morton. Oh, Meredith Morton is, of course, Sarah Jessica Parker. In the Family Stone. Wonderful work it is Sarah Jessica Parker in the Family Stone. <laughs> Daniel, Shelley Stewart. Or Shelley Stewart. <laughs> um, I, I think, is it? I want to say it's, whatever, it's a game, who cares? I want to say it's Sarah Jessica Parker in First Wives Club. Yay! <laughs> I'm so happy. I totally milk it. It's ridiculous. It sure is. Yay! Oh my god, such a fun role. She's so good in it. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, Michael Dolores Fuller. It must be. Is it Sarah Michelle Gellar? No. Is Have it you got Sarah a Michelle? guess of a film to go with it? Oh yeah, I think it's Suburban Girl. 
but I okay. could be totally wrong. It is not that. Daniel, okay. have you got any idea as to who Dolores Fuller is? I actually think I do. I think it is Sarah Jessica Parker in Ed Wood. It absolutely oh, is. Yeah. SJP in Ed oh. Wood as Dolores Fuller. Um, well, that wraps up the quiz, and I can reveal that with only two-point lead, our guest does win it again. Daniel, congratulations. You've, you've Thank cracked you. it. You've got a cookbook. What a time to be alive. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you. And we expect we'll do this podcast again, but in person, and you'll have cooked us something fantastic from the Sarah Michelle Geller cookbook. Guaranteed, 100%. Can't wait. Um, fabulous. Well, from that dive into the past, let's cast our eyes to the future, as we so like to do, and maybe talk about some things we would like for her. I think this is a really interesting one, actually, based on our conversation at the beginning and, and maybe it was kind of a a moment in time and, and it, it being hard to kind of break through that but I'm still pretty sure we've got some ideas of things we'd like to see her in um, so maybe Daniel you could kick us off is there something that you would present as a, something you'd like to see from Miss Sarah Michelle yeah I think <clears throat> as I kind of harped on about the whole kind of like genre side of it but she's done horror I mean I would like to see her do more but um I, I, the thing that kind of kept coming to me was a character like Julia Louis-Dreyfus in Veep something like very oh, heightened yes. like a bad kind of character someone who's you know very like annoying but doesn't care that they behave that way I think she could tap into that well in the way of Cruel Intentions and in the way of Daphne as well, someone that like maybe doesn't know they're funny because they're such a like grotesque type exaggerated character. I think that would be really fun for her. Maybe like a 10 episodes, 20 minute HBO comedy drama. I don't know. What, I don't know the character she yeah, would play, but something and like. I think she surely is right. Amanda e and esque Yeah, a TV show of her own. I think that would be perfect. Sold. Love it. Um, I I kind of thought, and this is a very broad answer, and, and to be honest, maybe the, the least interesting answer I've ever given, but to me, I just, it would make so much sense, is given the sort of devout fandom that she has, and, and sort of the geek fandom that still exists around Buffy, it's weird that Marvel haven't kind of given that some thought and gone, um, how about we play into an already existing fan base who would die to see... Buffy exist in the Marvel Universe and obviously not Buffy but Sarah Michelle Gellar kicking ass getting to use those mad kind of taekwondo skills as I don't know what kind of character but it would just seem to be an automatic fit and because there is so much room for characters and roles within the Marvel Universe it wouldn't necessarily have to be the biggest one ever but it would be such a kind of launching back pad for the the return of of Sarah Michelle Gellar so it just it's hey it's not strange because there's still plenty of performers who haven't been in in the Marvel universe but I just I almost imagine that that name surely will have come up if people are thinking like how do we cash in on on the the love of the internet fandom geek culture it would surely work out so I would like to see her in Marvel, and maybe I'd be more keen to trot along to the cinema with more glee to see a Marvel film with Sarah Michelle Gellar was kicking ass in it. So that's my first yeah. suggestion. Um, my first suggestion is kind of, is a directing pair, but also there is a, a, a something I am interested in her doing, but the Wazowskis. Oh, um, sure. A, because... I just, I just think they have such an interesting view of the world and what they create. Um, and I think there's a sense of like hyper realness to that, which she would be good at. I'm also reading a book at the moment called Circe, which is very popular by Madeline Miller, which is a historical kind of Greek about a Greek god played with Circe. Um, I'm only halfway through, so it, I don't want to spoil it, but she, the setup is like she's this daughter of gods who is basically sidelined, but she finds um, the story gives her agency, let's say, and it's it's a bit like, in my mind, Game of Thrones, like Daenerys sort of character, 
but with somebody that would be able to play that part well. Um, and I think Fair Michelle <laughs> would be very good at that. <laughs> Whoopsie. I just think I I just and I would I just love like l- the idea of her in this sort of like campy soap opera world. So yeah, that would be my first shout. Her in a proper lead role in a movie, in an original sort of story or adapted from a book. Love it, love it. Um, yeah, good one, Daniel. What else do you have for the table? Um, yeah, Michael sort of seduced me now, thinking lead, but it's just something I feel like she doesn't wouldn't want to do I don't know why I feel like yeah. she's just happy cooking um I don't think she like wants to be in it but just because I watched it recently one thing came to mind kind of straight away um in White Lotus Connie Britton's character oh good I like that. and I think like I think Connie Britton like I really like her as a performer but I think I can understand the criticism that she gets as being kind of like a one-dimensional performer mm. she doesn't necessarily give a lot but I think that is totally fine for the character she plays I can imagine her playing someone who's slightly privileged who maybe thinks they're more liberal than they are but also like I'm thinking of this scene in White Lotus kind of spoiler but where she's like looking at like her partner's testicles or something and it's like she just doesn't really give anything and it's like they're fine they're not swollen we need to go there's a breakfast buffet that we've paid for and it's like I just think that she could handle that humor hidden in someone that doesn't realize they're funny but performing it she would know it's funny but the gag is the character doesn't know it's funny I think I could see her in like an ensemble an ensemble piece like that just stealing a, a Connie Britton role from Connie yeah no that's that is a good shout. I I wouldn't have thought to put those two together, but that's it. Like, she's good, but we see her we see her do the same things. Um, so sure, it would make sense. Sarah Michelle Gellar would probably be fabulous at that and give a different side to it because we've not seen her on screen getting to do that before. So it would be so much fun. Um, leaning on the comedy thing there, and I th- I think you guys had mentioned it much earlier on about getting to see her do comedy more because she certainly has the chops for it. Um, Kind of now, I mean, she's also ageless, so it's not that she looks any different, but, you know, she's a mom now um, and and loves being a mom. So she could quite naturally play a scheming type mom role. I mean, I'm a fan of the bad moms films. I don't know how much other people are on that train with me, but I really like them and something like that would work. But we could even go for something crafted maybe a little more expertly, perhaps. And I was thinking, kind of toying with an aged version of her Sarah character in Cruel Intentions, that kind of vibe. But then in a comedy, say, playing against someone like Rose Byrne as, like, scheming neighbours trying to one-up each other as, like, (laughs) moms trying to one-up each other at the uh, PTA meeting, something like that. But having it being written by either sort of like a Kristen Wiig Annie Momolo combo or like Tina Fey with with somebody just giving them the really good material and just because I love seeing Roseburn doing stuff like that uh, I would I would love to see them as one-upping neighbors moms type situation I love it um okay so my last thing is still putting her as a lead in a film which is say artistically driven but I was really taken by her performance in I Know What You Did Last Summer and the sense of like I didn't get to achieve what I wanted like I lived my best years in college and I thought like someone someone could come and take that idea and really do something with it and also I was trying to think of like recent films where there's been female performances at the center that are kind of performed performed as part of it and the one film that jumped into mind was Promising Young Woman and Emerald Fennell. So I was thinking oh, Emerald yes. Fennell to make something with Sarah Michelle Geller focused on this sort of like, she's angry at the world because of, like, so we have all these like toxic male, like angry at the world, like I deserve more, I all these things were promised. But a female version of that, I just think would be really good. And I think she'd be terrific mm-hmm. in that part. And in the sort of, world that Emerald Fennell creates, I think if we're looking at Killing Eve and uh, season two and Promising Young Woman. So I think that would be so exciting. I don't know. That's, I'd love to see that. Uh, I, yeah, would love I that. think that would be a great pairing. You've just spurred something in my head. It would never happen because it would be too on the nose. But if it was something like she played it was like set in Hollywood and she played the lead in a very successful supernatural 
drama comedy with an abusive type showrunner that everyone oh, hates. Oh yes, like everyone credits for being like <gasps> such a feminist person, but maybe in the practice aren't. That would be like a really funny kind of biting satire oh. to have her replaying her oh. life almost. Um, oh my god, that would be amazing. Emerald or Hollywood, if you're listening, come on. Yeah. Well, she, Emerald is one of our biggest uh, yeah, fans, so I'm sure said. she'll be. <laughs> we'll have to copyright this. I'm sorry, Emerald, <laughs> but we need some money for this idea. <laughs> oh, that's but yeah, it's going to be interesting because it kind of seems like she, we won't see much of, like, a TV no. seems to be where we will get Sarah Michelle. Yeah, um, I think surely we'll see something. But The one thing that makes me think I want to mention, because you, I kind of mentioned it, Scott, was something about uh like cruel intentions type where would she be now is she did film a pilot for hbo of like the and it's like not if you've catched it like if you caught it online it's like not like particularly compelling but like that would you know it's a shame that i think she doesn't carry um the clout that people perhaps feel she should deserve when it comes to the people that greenlight certain shows and i'm not necessarily advocating the cruel intentions kind of sequel if you like but i agree i I don't feel like there's momentum or desire for her to lead a, a show, sad as that is. If if Sarah Michelle Gellar's out there going, can I have some good work, please? Can somebody give her some good work? But if she just wants to write another cookbook and that's her jam now, then great. Then, then hey, that's, that's a wonderful thing. But we'd all be very keen to see more Sarah Michelle Gellar. We're hungry for you. Come back. You are... Um, a one-of-a-kind icon, and I'm glad to have have done this episode and to have revisited her work. So thank you, Daniel, for bringing Miss Sarah along, and thank you for for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and we would love to have you back. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, Michael, uh, how about you tell everyone listening where they can find us if they have any thoughts or feelings? Yes, well, you can find us on Instagram or Twitter at don't know her underscore pod. Um, and you can also drop us an email at don't know her pod at gmail.com. Um, we ask you to share, follow, subscribe, like all the things um, to give us support. And yeah, we really value hearing from you. But yes, thanks everyone. Thanks for listening. Please share, do all the things. Thanks again, Daniel. Um, have a yeah. wonderful day wherever you are. Thank you. Bye 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 bye. Bye. Bye.